And then went on to explain how this was obviously going to be a very long involved therapy because his mother was perseverating on P sounds, etc., etc. So as soon as the therapist left the room, his mother picked up and threw and smashed everything that was throwable and smashable in a, in a fit of frustrated rage, which immediately got her labeled by the hospital staff on her record as a belligerent, non-cooperative, non-compliant patient. And he said they checked her out of the hospital the next day, took her home and put, them, put her in their own homes instead of the program. Now, the point there was that the therapist had the blinders on, had a specific right answer that she was looking for, and didn't hear what the right question was that should have been asked. I want to suggest to you that that's the history of our investigation of the nervous system. That's indeed the history of scientific investigation for the last at least 2,500 years in Western culture and civilization. We have gone on a search for boundary conditions. That's what, in, in physics, you talk about the search for boundary conditions, the definition of boundary conditions. And all of scientific investigation has been a search for boundary conditions. And anything that falls outside the boundary conditions is a wrong answer, not something that goes us into going looking for a right question. Until the 20th century and the advent of quantum physics, and we suddenly discovered, whoa, wait a minute, maybe the boundary conditions don't hold everything that exists. Maybe we need to expand our concept of reality a bit. Second piece of consciousness expansion that I would like to, or, or at least seduction that I would like to lead you with, is a book by Joseph Campbell takes up on this whole concept of maybe there's more truth around than we're allowing ourselves to believe. A book called The Power of Myth. Campbell spent his whole life studying mythology, classical mythology. His first major book was called The Hero with a Thousand Faces, where he examined the epic hero and what the epic hero had to tell us. But in The Power of Myth, he redefines myth. He defines myth as not fantasy, not fiction, not make-up stories, but as truth told in metaphor when a scientific database language was unavailable for telling the truth. And he uses an example, not in this book, but in another book, of what that metaphor truth-telling is like. He said, suppose you know somebody, and I'm taking some real liberties with it, so if there's anything wrong with the example, it's my problem, not, not Campbell's. But he says, suppose you know somebody named John, and you know that John is a fleet and agile runner of the high hurdles. Really, is just I mean, poetry in motion as he runs the high hurdles. You could describe John's running and jumping ability in terms of skeletal biomechanics, of uh, jumping abilities. But if you happen to live at a time and a place where you have no access to that database language, you might simply say, John is an antelope. And that's metaphor. Now, verifiably, on a factual database level, John is not an antelope. John is a human being. But on a metaphor level, there is a great deal of truth about John that is conveyed to us in that statement, John is an antelope. And what Campbell maintains is that there is a metaphor level of truth-telling and a database level of truth-telling, which are alternate ways of viewing the same body of truth. Neither is more right nor more wrong. They are simply different ways of describing the body of truth. And what I'd like to suggest to you is that, that very often, clinical truths are told in a language of clinical <coughs> metaphor because either the, the database language is unknown or is unavailable to the clinicians. But very often, the truths about biological systems are first discovered by clinicians, by practitioners, by educators, by the people doing the interactions on a day-to-day -day basis with the biological systems. But also, very often, those people lack a scientific database language with which to describe it. And so they use metaphor. 
They use clinical stories, clinical mythology. That's one way of looking at the truth. Another way of looking at the truth is the database, scientific basis of looking at it. And neither stands independent or separate as the one way. They are different ways of looking at truth. What I hope we can do together in, in the three or four days that we're here is to explore some of the metaphor, some of the clinical stories, and see if there isn't some scientific database truth to go along with those. Not that one or the other is more necessary, but to see if there isn't a synergy rather than a battle that can develop between those two levels of discourse. So those are my biases and prejudices that I start out with, and those are important, I guess, for you to know up front. What I would like to talk, to start with, as you can see, that this is a really pretentious title that I've given to this whole thing, but I didn't know how to get all the stuff in, so I just, I just wrote all the words up there. Specific versus distributed damage, localization versus generalization of function, emergent process versus static product, plasticity versus stability in neural rehabilitation. By the way, as I was getting these books out, it dawned on me that there are some very, really outstanding PTOT books in neural rehabilitation that I don't have here, and during one of the breaks I will run over to my other office over in OT and pick those up and bring them back. I think there's some really good references that, that you might like to, uh, to take a look at. Let's talk, just start off talking about lesions in traumatic brain injury or traumatic brain dysfunction or just brain dysfunction. We usually think about, well, three different classes of brain injury that are the, the, the majority of the ones that fall in the TBI category. The anoxic or, or oxygen starvation type of, of dysfunction, uh, the hemorrhagic or, or uh, embolytic type dysfunction uh, where you have some, some, some dysfunction in cardiovascular supply to the nervous system or the uh, uh, head injury, uh, the blow to the head kind of dysfunction. What I want to start with is to talk about that, that head injury and how that can lead into, uh, to, to sort of follow on from what Leonard was saying this morning but so how that falls on with some of the hemorrhagic kinds of things. We tend to think of, of head injury in terms of where we get the damage, where we see the damage. Somebody is in a car accident, head drives forward and smashes into the, the dashboard, we get a big bruise or uh, a cut or some damage up here and we say, aha, immediately frontal lobe damage. Well, that's probably a good guess that frontal lobes did in fact collide with the, uh, uh, the front of the, uh, the skull. But as, as Leonard pointed out this morning, uh, the, the principal name for the majority of head injuries is coup contra coup, the blow counter blow. You get the, the primary direct blow and then the indirect counter blow. Uh, and, and again, as Leonard no power. Well, I, uh, well. Oh wait, I went backwards, sorry. That's a mush word failure up here. Uh, again, these, the slides that I will use are largely come, come out of Netter's two volumes on the nervous system. Actually, it's one volume, volume one, part one is anatomy and physiology, part two is physiologic and neuromuscular disorders. And most of the slides that I will read come from But here again is, is again, just showing the, the central nervous system inside you floating. Remember, it floats. It is not only filled with cerebrospinal fluid, but because of the drainage out of the various foramina, it floats in there. And so we have this three pounds or so of brain floating in there. And if, in fact, the head lurches forward, think about when you put a coffee cup up on the dashboard or down on the floor of your car, and you suddenly come to a, a, an abrupt stop. What happens with the coffee? Coffee keeps moving forward because it is free and liquid and able to move. Well, the same thing happens with the brain. If the, if the skull stops, 
on the dashboard, brains just floating in liquid, inertia is going to take over and it's going to bound right into the front of the skull. Then immediately, as you get the whiplash back, you get the head rebound and you get the brain doing the same thing in a backward direction and who gets hit back at the back? <coughs> the occipital pole. Okay, so in, all, in, in a vast majority of the usual head injury of hitting the head on the dash or the windshield, visual cortex is definitely going to be impacted in some way or another. There's another point though, and that remember, we don't have a longitudinal nervous system like, like the other, well, all but the primates, like all the other mammals. All the other mammals, you know, have their nervous system all laid out in a straight line right along their back. We bring our back up like this, and we turn almost a 90 degree bend here. And notice where that bend is. That bend is right here between the diencephalon, the thalamus and hypothalamus, and the midbrain. And this whole part sits in a much more confining bony cavity than does this part. And so there's less movement possibility here than there is up here. Okay? And so this little skinny flexure point becomes a very vulnerable point for that forebrain, the three pounds up there, moving against this half pound or so brainstem, and shearing forces can occur right here. Now what is right here? Superior colliculus that Leonard talked about this morning, and right below the superior colliculus, the third nerve nucleus, the oculomotor nerve. Can you point to the reticular activating system? The reticular activating system runs up and down through this whole core here, all the way from the base of the medulla right up to the level of the third nerve nucleus. So it's all along in through there. And in fact, I'm going to talk more about that on Monday. Some, some more complete pictures of that. So not only do you have with the typical head injury, the coup contra coup kind of thing, possibly, <coughs> but you also have this shearing force right here that has a great deal of, of potential visual system involvement. So it, it, it is a I don't want to say a falsehood, but it is a uh, I think a misleading simplicity for us to look at where the head injury occurs and assume that we can now localize what part of the nervous system may be involved. Second issue, of course, is exactly the thing that Leonard talked about this morning. These blood vessels that pass between the brain and the venous supply returns are just really sitting there, sitting ducks for shearing forces to slice them off and to get subdural hematomas all over the place. And so even with a, with a localized head injury in one place, you may have subdural hematomas almost any place in there and never know it. I mean, when, when Reagan was a perfect example, when he fell off, he fell and hit his head back over here and the hematoma developed up in the contra coup region over on the other side. So you don't really have a clue as to what kinds of subdural hematomas might be going on until you start doing the, the diagnostic examination. Uh, I guess the point that I want to make is that there are all kinds of possible damages that can occur inside from a single localized blow, where the localized blow looks like it should tell you something about what's been damaged, but there is all this hidden stuff inside from that that three pound floating stuff in there gyrating around on that tenuous little stalk of the brainstem connection. It's the narrowest part of the brain. It's right there at the midbrain where that flexion is. And it's really vulnerable for all kinds of things to, to uh, potentially happen. The anoxic type of event, which it can occur from a any of the cerebral vascular type of accidents, bleeding, blockage, where you, you just simply reduce the level of oxygen to, available to the brain, or 
for whatever reason you have the, the air, air pathways blocked or respiration simply stops or for whatever reason, that tends to give you a very diffuse kind of loss. The brain stem well, maybe tends to be a little less uh, uh, susceptible to anoxic losses, but, but there's a lot of controversy in the literature about that. In general, you, you see a lot of diffuse damage throughout the system. Typically, that diffuse damage, if it is, if it is not extensive, that is, if the anoxic period has not taken very long, the diffuse damage probably will not show itself terribly much uh, in terms of observable behavior with one major exception. And again, that is the brainstem area. Because because the brainstem, this region down through here, comprises only some <coughs> 10 to 15 percent of the total cellular mass of the central nervous system. So if you have, let's say 10 percent, if you have 10 percent cell loss in 10 percent of the mass, that's 1 percent of the total mass of the brain going there. Whereas, and, and, and the numbers of cells involved in various functions down here are far fewer. And so just a few cells lost down here may have a major impact on behavioral outcomes, whereas the same few cell losses up here in cortex, where you have lots and lots of redundancy, may not give you noticeable losses. And so a lot of times we'll see in, in, in stroke patients, for example, where the stroke has been deep in the, in the brain, where brainstem involvement is, has occur occurred, you see what looks like total recovery, except the person's not the same. There are kind of little idiosyncratic things that happen. Uh, they, may, they may complain in terms of vision. They may complain about double vision. They may complain about blurry vision. Well, again, I'm here in the, you've got the third nerve nucleus here, fourth nerve, sixth nerve. Uh, you've got the superior colliculus right in this region. All of those susceptible to the anoxic damages that may, in fact, give you various kinds of clinical signs and symptoms. I, I don't want to dwell so much on the clinical signs and symptoms as to suggest to you that uh, there are lots of places to go looking. And when you get a visual dysfunction, you don't just simply go looking at the primary visual pathway and say, well, everything's okay in the primary visual pathway, what's the problem? There are lots of other places in the system, lots of different locations, not localized in one little place, but throughout the system, that may be uh, something that you should go looking at in terms of diagnostics. Uh, the, the, thanks. the diagnostics that are available are, are pretty fantastic today, and they're getting better and better and better. Bob Yolton is going to talk with you tomorrow about some of the really new techniques. I mean, there are some cutting-edge technologies that, that will blow your mind about what we can do in terms of imaging and, and finding out for example, where a lesion is localized. We can go in, for example, with, with CAT scans, computerized tomography, and we can go in and have a look at uh, uh, anatomical detail. Uh, for example, in, in one of the, uh, the pictures here from, from Netter's book, you see CAT scans here, which will allow you to go in and look with some some amount of detail, some of the anatomical features, the, the ventricles and some of the other, the major parts of the brain, for example. Um, here's some other CAT scans that allow you to see some abnormalities, a hematoma here and some other edematous kinds of things, allow you to see the ventricles showing up and so forth. Gave us, began, the CAT scans began to give us the ability to look inside without invading and to find out what was going on in there. Uh, MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, came along and gave us an even, uh, a, a yet a different tool that gave us a whole lot more resolution, allowed us to begin to actually visualize gyral patterns 
And, and, and a little later this afternoon when, uh, when we talk about some of the, a couple of the cases that you guys are going to be looking at, I've got some actual MRIs of one patient that will show you a variation in gyral pattern that probably has some major uh, uh, impact on what you ex would expect and what you in fact will find with that particular patient. So the MRIs allow you to get an even greater imaging. The, uh, with the MRI, you're actually looking at the water molecules in the brain. What, what magnetic resonance imaging does uh, is to put you put your wrist put into a big magnetic field. And water molecules are polar. As the two hydrogen molecules come off sort of up like this, and the oxygen is down here, there's a 120 degree angle between the two hydrogens, and that gives a slight positive charge to the hydrogen side and a slight negative charge to the oxygen side. So if you put those into a magnetic field, all the water molecules line up. And then if, in fact, you release them at some point from that magnetic uh, field or disturb it or allow them to go back to their random position, then they in fact release the energy that has been stored in them in that magnetic lining up, and that can be imaged on the <coughs> excuse me on an X-ray type film. And so here you can see the actually you can see the gyral patterns, some of the gyral patterns on here. And again, it allows us to get in and see asymmetries left and right where some, something has happened on one side that is quite different from the other side and, and, and allowed us a, a good deal more detail in uh, determining what, uh, what kinds of dysfunction or, or what kinds of damage at least might have taken place in the system. Uh, another technique that has come on the, the scene here of late uh, in the last 10 years or so is the PET scan, the positron emission tomography scan, which is a kind of functional look rather than just a structural look. Uh, began to get us to taking a look at function in the brain, not just structure, but what's happening in there. Uh, the kind of thing that, that Leonard talked a little bit about this morning with the uh, uh, metabolic activity within the brain and how you can visualize well, the PET scan allows us to do that uh, in, in different ways without killing the animal or the, the subject, the patient. Not many people want to give their brains up for science just so you can get in there. The PET scan allows us to do it without that kind of thing. Uh, the electroencephalograph, evoked potential approach, and the so-called beam scan or brain electrical activity mapping also give us windows on function so we can begin to look at functional aspects. Uh, with respect to, to one of the patients we're going to talk about, MRIs and beam scans, because they give us a, a dual kind of information about localization of damage or tissue that is not normal in organization, and give us information about localization of dysfunction. And together, those two can be, can be real powerful kinds of diagnostic tools. Uh, one other picture here, just an EEG. Oh, more, well, these are more MRI scans, and then 
are various kinds of behaviors are going on in the rest state while the patient is doing uh, various kinds of, of, of mental activity, thought uh, problems, or uh, in testing for seizure disorders while the patient is hyperventilating, for example, all sorts of different kinds of, of uh, tests, functional tests that can be run, and you can watch then the electrical activity between any pair of electrodes and get a general sense of what's going on in that region or not going on in that region of the brain. Uh, all of these are techniques for localizing where brain damage has been done and for localizing where brain dysfunction is. So why do we care? Why do we go looking for where localized damage has occurred? What difference does it make? Not a rhetorical question. Somebody give me an answer. What difference does it make? What part of the brain might have gotten damaged from a, a stroke or a head trauma or whatever? Who cares? Location versus function. function. Location versus function. Localization of function, right? I mean, that's the real issue, is the localization of function issue. So the value in localizing that lesion, first is to visualize the nature of the lesion, the extent of the lesion, but really, the, the real value that we see, and that is just kind of gut level automatic that we think about, is correlation of the lesion locus with the type or degree of dysfunction. Okay? And that's the real issue that we go looking for. Now, localization of function is kind of the law of the land with respect to the way the beliefs in the scientific community have developed about the nervous system. Function is localized. Question is, is that the only way the brain functions? Or is that just one possibility? Quantum physics led us to believe in this century that the Newtonian laws of physics were not absolutes any longer, but had to be considered as high probability outcomes under normal and usual conditions of observation. Richard Feynman won the Nobel Prize in physics in 1967 for taking on all of the Newtonian optics laws and showing that they were not absolute, that there were always conditions under which you could find something other than the predicted outcome of the optics loss. For example, the angle of incidence, angle of reflection law of, uh, that, that's been around for at least since Newton and before. The light comes off a mirror at the same angle that, it's, that it, 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 it hits the mirror. And what Feynman showed was, yes, that's the normal and usual. That's the high probability outcome under normal and usual conditions. But it's also possible for on that same plane mirror for a light to come from here, hit this far edge, and jump over here to a detector. That is a possibility. And that if you set up the conditions of observation correctly, you do the right kinds of things in terms of canceling probabilities of potential light pathways, and actually you can demonstrate light traveling those non-angle of incidence angle of reflection pathways. He gave that first paper in 1962 at the American Physical Society meetings, and a 20-minute paper turned into a two-and-a-half-hour route because no one was letting him off the stage until everybody came up to see what kind of chicanery he was pulling because nobody believed it could happen. Five years later, he won the Nobel Prize for having demonstrated mathematically and in actuality that there are other possibilities than the Newtonian laws. What I think the last 20 years has taught us, and particularly the last 10 years has taught us, is the same, can be, same kinds of statements can be made for the brain function. That localization of function is the normal and usual outcome under normal and usual, or the high probability outcome under normal and usual sets of conditions <coughs> of genetics and of development. But I always ask clinicians, how many of your patients, how many of your clients come to see you 
under normal and usual conditions. And yet we will continue to insist that they meet the normal and usual conditions laws. Instead of asking ourselves, might there be a different question that we should go asking for this abnormal, unusual patient? I think in the last 10 to 15 years, the research in, in developmental neurobiology, the research in psychoneuroimmunology has led us to believe, yes, indeed, maybe we should be asking alternate questions and finding out that there are very, very different ways of looking at them. That, in fact, what has been held up as old wives' tales, as clinical mythology, may, in fact, have been a telling of metaphoric truth about those pathways out on the ends of the mirror, which sounded so absurd and so ridiculous that nobody could take them very seriously, and yet were the first glimmerings that there were, in fact, these low probability outcome possibilities out there. I think clinicians knew about brain plasticity long before scientists ever imagined that it was a possibility. Well, than most scientists. We're supposed to take a five.